Coming up on Digital Music Trends 194, recorded on the 30th of July 2014, a special show focused on independent musicians as we chat about Bandcamp, fan interaction, Spotify, YouTube, copyright review and a lot more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and if you'd like to receive a weekly newsletter on the, the latest shows that are coming out, uh, please sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list. And uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome three great guests, uh, starting with Zoe Keating. If you don't know her, she's a wonderful artist uh, producing uh, music with her uh, cello, it's uh, mostly solo cello music which is amazing and it's really great to have you here today Zoe. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And it's also a real pleasure to mm. welcome uh, Steve Lawson, another great independent artist who is a, a solo a bass guitarist. So it's a, it's a solo musician today. It's, it's pretty great. Hello. Hello. Hey, nice how's it going? And you're in Birmingham, right? Yes. Great. Sorry. Awesome. And Zoe's in San Francisco. So we're spread out today. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all pretty... Um, <laughs> Uh, sort of spread across time zones and uh, uh, last but not least it's a great to welcome uh, Glenn Peoples from uh, Billboard uh, back on the show uh, if you don't read his pieces on Billboard you should so go and check him out on billboard.com and uh, hi mm -hmm. Glenn and thanks for joining me hi thanks for having me again Awesome. So uh, today it's going to be a bit of a different show than usual. I guess it's a sort of a, uh, a, a summer. We don't have as many news to talk about, but it's actually quite great because we get to talk about a few uh, different things actually than what we usually cover on the show. Uh, and uh, we're going to use uh, some of the stories that um, came up this week as sort of a, uh, a way to leapfrog and then talk about uh, different issues that are involving independent artists as well. So uh, I wanted to start by talking about uh, a, a commentary piece that was posted on Digital Music News that considers the role of platforms like uh, Bandcamp, uh, uh, Patreon and Pledge and, and how they are changing the way uh, you know uh, independent artists can monetize their music uh, uh, you know that the article says uh, can this company save sc streaming and the music industry so uh, you know Bandcamp for example has paid out over 76 million dollars uh, to artists and continues to pay uh, out uh, nearly three million dollars a month uh, you know they've tripled where they were 24 months ago the 50,000 unique artists sell something every month uh, and uh, so a, a great success story there and so uh, you know the the article basically points uh, band cam uh, you know, port portrays Bandcamp, Patreon and Pledge as potential saviors of the music industry, especially for independence. Uh, and uh, Glenn, so uh, uh, starting with your perspectives, sort of uh, as an as a independent uh, observer, what do you make of the growth of these platforms in the last two years and how do you see them perhaps disrupt uh, uh, the uh, mainstream narrative, which is that, that you know, people are moving away from downloads and moving to streaming and there's no two ways about it. But these platforms actually seem to be changing how the narrative is, is shaping up in, on that front. Well, these platforms show that people still buy things, if yeah. that's what you're getting at. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I remember the digital music news uh, guest post correctly, this person was encouraging Bandcamp to create a streaming service. Right. Um, and I, I, and I, I found that really weird. I think Bandcamp is, is so successful because it does one thing and it does it really well. Yeah. And that's, a very, that's an old adage in business. Don't, get, don't lose focus. Just focus on one thing, do it really well, and then once maybe you do that really well, you can move on. Yeah. And I think Bandcamp is, is um, special in that it it's, has a narrow focus. It, it doesn't want to be a digital distributor. It doesn't, uh, my guess only right now, it doesn't want to be a streaming company. It doesn't want to be all things to all people. It wants to focus on one thing. Yeah. And, and I think Pledge Music, I think other companies will probably uh, follow the same path. Yeah, at least I hope they do. I don't want I don't want companies losing focus before they get really good at what they set out to do. Absolutely, and I, of course, you know, I, I didn't mention that part of the article because I, I wanted to focus, of course, on the on the uh, download side of things and, and sales. But uh, that was an interesting point. But I, again, I agree with you, Glenn, completely. That I, I don't see these companies needing to do streaming uh, right now. It, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and and yeah. I wanted to ask you to turn the question to to sort of Zoe and Steve. You use Bandcap a, a lot uh, to sell your music, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine you try and direct as many people uh, to uh, Bandcamp as possible. So uh, starting with Zoe, I guess, uh, when did you start using Bandcamp and how has that helped you uh, along the way? Um, I started using Bandcamp for my last recording that I released, which was uh, right when my son was born in 2010. And I was looking at the time for a way that I could, you know, get my music as directly to my fans as possible, and um, that I could also, it was sort of easy to manage and um, various criteria. And I, it was actually, it was Steve Lawson who told me about Bandcamp. I didn't know right. about it before. Mm -hmm. It was both Steve Lawson and I think uh, my friend Amanda Palmer, they were both um, into it. Yeah. And so I immediately <laughs> signed up and um, the, uh, 
let's put it this way. <laughs> I put my album out and um, a couple weeks after my son was born and I was able to set up the entire thing from bed, like while he was sleeping. <laughs> like wow. that, that's how easy it was to do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, like sort of in between those like little in between hours that you get as a new parent, um, that's how I released it. And it is sort of my the primary way that my core fans, sort of the true fans, that's where they get my music first, is they go there. And um, that's, um, I have my website kind of built around it. So um, it's it's very valuable. I like the way that it um, lets sort of my whales contribute yeah. more and, you know, uh, other people can c- contribute the minimum or um, it sort of has that flexibility. And it's it's sort of, I feel like it's designed for an artist like me where I have a core fan base that wants to support me as an artist. Yeah. Um, so, and then kind of like they want the music second in some ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, St- Steve, on, on your front, uh, 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 did you use it longer than Zoe? Like uh, as, as you uh, might, might have actually turned her on to it. Uh, uh, and and how did you come ac- come across it? Um, I think I came across it because it was set up that Ethan Diamond, who started Bandcamp and runs it, um, did it partially inspired by an ebook written by a colleague of mine, Andrew Dubber, who was on the show last yeah. week or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Me. So yeah, so I mean, D- Dubber's sort of ideas were were very heavily involved in that, and Dubber and I have been friends and working together and and trying to solve all the world's problems together for. A, uh, five or six years and so i guess when when he, he was he told me about it very early on and I, so i signed up very early and it, it it fitted the way that i thought about things yeah. completely because i wanted to be able to mess with pricing i could i could see on on itunes that that you know the the, the big labels were constantly playing pricing games and they'd reduce things to, to three bucks for a week and see what would happen and 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 but us as indies we couldn't do that we didn't know who was buying our stuff we couldn't it was all fixed price you know everything was 7.99 or 9.99 in the states yeah and they decided whether or not long tracks were whatever and 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 you could only listen to at that point 30 seconds of it as a a preview which just seemed insane so Bandcamp basically it's almost like i'd given them a list that didn't exist and said here you are can you fix all of these things and they went yeah sure and here's a load of other cool stuff as well yeah so it did. It, it did a couple of things for me. One of which is, is is that my last I don't know something like eleven releases or no maybe fifteen releases I haven't <laughs> haven't because like I lose track. I put an album out yesterday. Um, nice. Uh, I just, like that. Th- that was recorded on Saturday. Well, no. Well, well except you can't even yeah. buy it. You have, you have to buy two other records in order to get it. It's just I'll, I'll explain some of that later on. But but it's meant that I I release a lot more music. I, I'm yeah. very prolific. I'm an improviser, and so. You know, and fairly good one. So lots of what I do, especially when I'm interacting with other musicians, that turns into stuff that's worth putting out there. But awesome. it's not the kind of thing that it's, it's worth me building a, a campaign around. I don't want. I don't want to have to spend money on marketing. I want to put it out there and get on to the next thing. And so I only need, you know, a, a, a very very small number of interested people to make it viable. And viability for me is being able to release music in a way that doesn't stop me releasing more music. Yeah, yeah. I sure. just want to, to. I want to keep making things. Um, and so. Bandcamp is is <laughs> Bandcamp is pretty much the, the only place I can imagine being able to do that. So yeah, it's it's a service that's built for that. I mean, I, and so yeah, I haven't I, I don't even bother putting things on iTunes or right, any, yeah. anything else anymore. I, I mean, I, I should I, I've got I, I recently signed up with a different um, uh, aggregation partner, but I'm I'm so picky. I mean, I took all my stuff off Spotify because why would I go on Spotify? I don't use it. I don't yeah. I don't particularly yeah, yeah, agree sure. with the way they do things. I don't I don't shop on Amazon anymore, so I don't want to put my music on Amazon because I don't like the way they do things. If they start paying tax, I might. So so I'm kind of I'm I'm I sort of hamstrung by my own ethics. To yeah. the point where I go, well, great, well I'll just put it all in Bandcamp and then it'll be fine. It's very cool, uh, uh, Glenn. I wanted to sort of bring it back to the communications point. Uh, you know, a lot of this the, these platforms actually have made, do a really good job at enabling sort of a conversation between the artists and, uh, uh, and and the fan base that is buying the music and I guess that's really what's lacking from the likes of iTunes and also from Spotify to, uh, to a degree there's not much of a two-way communication going on there so h- how important do you think that is to artists you know of course you're based in Nashville so lots of independent artists there I'm sure you you know that have to deal with finding a way to really communicate with people that are buying their stuff yeah well i think the artists here could speak to that better than i could um you know as a consumer i have always got the feeling that artists like Bandcamp because they identify with it and and like steve says there are other reasons you might not want to be on certain platforms if you just have disagreements with certain business practices or big business practices because these are big companies that are selling you music and um 
if you look long enough, you'll find something to dislike, honestly. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, so I, like, think, I, say, I think Bandcamp like just has that better relationship with people, mm -hmm. and, and it feels like a place for independent music. It feels more like, um, you know, made, to use an antiquated example, it feels more like a record store, I think, in that, that you, you go there and you find music and you find typically independent music. The, the, the big uh, one of the big things with bank up in terms of that business model thing that glenn's uh, getting out there is that they don't make money unless we make lots more money yeah and that that as a setup as a relationship between them and the artists is fantastic they can't they can't sell access to our stuff and make a load of money without us making anything with spotify this whole negotiated terms thing it's like well what however we negotiate the terms they're still in control of it it's still about them saying that's okay bank have set it up so that that, that in order for them to make their 10 or 15 percent we have to make 85 or 90 percent so the, you know whatever whatever they do that everything they do is in our best interest because in order for them to make money we have to make loads of money yeah and that that's a really really healthy position healthy relationship for us to have because they apply all of their intelligence to us doing okay out of music and i i, I like that a lot i like that a lot yeah yeah sure i think it shows that the band camp is is a very single purpose um a business where Apple and Amazon sell music ultimately for other means, um, but sure. like Steve says, Bandcamp's in it just to sell music for artists, and that's it. Yeah. And I think that shows. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Zoya, I wanted to ask you about the communication side of things, because of course uh, uh, you've uh, had a, like a massive life-changing event, I guess, in the last couple of months, mm -hmm. which is uh, like an awful thing that happened, and uh, and sort of that's really driven uh, a huge amount of support from your fan base and so of course you know uh, feel free to just go into as many much detail as little detail as, as, as you want because i know that it's, it's a very personal thing but as far as yeah. sort of how you've how your fans have managed to sort of really help uh, just morally on, on on what's going on well um yeah obviously my, my husband was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in may and it was really out of the blue non-smoker and stuff and um we uh, had sort of an issue in the first couple of weeks where the insurance company initially refused to cover his hospital stay. And, um, you know, those of you who aren't in the States <laughs> know that a hospital mm. stay is like, I mean, it was like $80,000. I finally started getting some, you know, the original bills. So, um, and we have health insurance. <laughs> and so I just sort of started talking about it on, on, on Twitter and I put a post up and um, within like um, hours really uh, just people started contributing to our cause and just donating and buying my albums. At first I only had Bandcamp up there. So everybody's, you know, I, that my last album has been out for years now and um, my new one, I'm supposed to release it this summer and I've sort of put everything on hold for now. But um, the, uh, everybody's got it already and, and it seemed like all my fans just went up to Bandcamp and they bought it again <laughs> for, you know, however much they wanted. So Bandcamp was kind of like the, um, the donation intermediary and then I set up sort of a donation account and people donated there. But I really was um, totally floored by the um, outpouring. I still am. And yeah. it's, um, oh, it's, it's uh, amazing. And, and you, yeah. use, you use Tumblr actually a, a lot to communicate with fans, right? Yeah. Yeah. I found, um, um, yeah, I, I have a blog. And so I, I, I just posted a, something on Tumblr and actually it, it had two things. One was that my audience was, you know, I had to talk to them about it because I tell them everything usually. Yeah. And one was that they could they could reach out, you know, and they could hear what's happening and I could connect with them and all that. But then the other thing about the Tumblr blog was that um, the local news station saw the blog right. and then they came over to our house and uh, did a, I, I asked my husband, who's not, he's not, he's normally in the background with my son and um, I said, are you okay with looking bad on television? <laughs> and he was like, okay. <laughs> so um, within, uh, within, 24 hours actually the insurance company called me personally and said you know oh this is a that was our standard form letter and we're so sorry that you've had this experience and don't worry um, <laughs> but um yeah. long story short it's just uh, it, it's sort of an example of um how you know in today's world like i my i'm only i only exist successfully as an artist because of my audience yeah. and um i have a direct connection with them and it's something that i've nurtured and they're important to me and it actually it's been going 
sometimes I think it's a one direction, a one way street, it feels for many artists. But whenever I'm, I remember when my son was born, it was similar, but this is a different situation. Yeah. Knowing that they're there and then just being able to talk to them on Facebook, and on Twitter, and, um, you know, is such a huge comfort for me yeah. to know that I'm not really, I don't know, I'm not alone. So yeah. it, it's like, I don't think artists talk about that much. Um, yeah. to, that, it's like, I need them <laughs> for more, for reasons more than them buying stuff. I just knowing that they're, they're listening is, is somehow really comforting. So it's a really human, Connection, I think yeah. services like Bandcamp and what have you, they, 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 emphasize how we are all humans and we are looking for these human things yeah so <laughs> yeah that's, that's uh, absolutely true and um, say steve on, on your front like did you feel in the, you know the same way that uh, you really take from the relationship with that uh, you have with your fans uh, from Bandcamp or other sources and and you can actually you know have this we, two-way two sweet relationship yeah i mean i think one of the things um, just talking about Bandcamp briefly before we get around to the is, is that it, it plays so nicely with other with other platforms because right. it's not trying because as Glenn says it's not it's not trying to do everything it's doing one thing, and so it interfaces well with Twitter. So you can have this community on Twitter and say and now if you want to buy if you want to go and buy or listen or share or talk about what I do you can take it you can take the links from from Bandcamp and and it embeds well on on Tumblr and all that kind of stuff. So it, so that Bandcamp becomes this sort of resource in the middle of it all, but it's not. It, it, it doesn't. It's not trying to say have the conversation here. You must talk about music here. Yeah. You, we, we need to build our own Twitter and our own Facebook within it because that would kind of destroy it. Yeah. Um, uh, but 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 yeah. the relationship relationship both with with my listeners. I, I I've got to the point now where I can't even use the word fans because most of yeah. them are most. Of, I just, it just seems so weird because it's like, well, I'm a fan of you. I'm a fan of your interesting list. Like and, and, and right. Yeah, 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 and and but I mean, I, I, and friends is kind of it. Maybe yeah. It, it, we're expanding the definition of it, but but they they play a role in my life that is not is is not just you know I put out music and they send me money. There's there's encouragement, there's support, there's there's mm -hmm. friendship, there's there's access to news and perspective and all kinds of stuff. And so there are people who I've met because they were they started out listening to my music and have become incredibly important friends, but also peers. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the number of, of musicians that I've met and maintain a relationship with, alongside all of that, because it's because everything's mixed up, yeah. um, we Could, buy each other's music and we talk about each other's music. And some and some of them are people who really, who, who I'm, I'm guessing don't really like my music, which is fine if a bass player plays on his own. It sounds more I mean, like a deal than a job want, anyway. Um, I'd love to say uh, something else about Bank yeah, which yeah, is, sure. you know, not to be a total advertisement for them, but... Um, just sort of comparing, all, we have a, we have all these different services, you know. For of course, we're in a year of I think uh, really the the change that we've all been talking about for a long time is happening. I think this year and will be complete by the end of year. <laughs> of that, everybody you know, streaming is the medium, and uh, it's hugely convenient and what have you. And I think that yes, for finding music, it's hugely convenient, but we still can never um, put aside this um the importance of connecting the artist with their listeners yeah. and so that's sort of why i do direct my energies i don't discourage other platforms but i direct my energies towards ways to get people to listen that i can maintain a connection with them so that if they listen to me via Bandcamp, then i have a way to find them and a way to reach them whereas that's sort of the issue mm. you know as marvelous as spotify is as a listening platform and there's no way for me to reach those fans and i don't get I've talked about data in the past, but at least with iTunes, because I have my I have a direct account with Apple, um, I can get at least randomized zip codes or postal codes of people who purchase on iTunes. But I don't get anything really from Spotify. They they have they they made that sort of thing to that put sense, put yeah. out um, some data for uh, artists in December, but I haven't really found it to be very useful. So it's still going to be the case that you know. Randomized zip codes are good too, but it's still having that email address. And the fact yeah. that I can offer music in exchange from email address is really um, important. So, Absolutely. so that's really, as we sort of complete this transition to streaming, services like Bandcamp and Patreon and what have you are going to become even more important for the artistic middle class, you know, yeah. I, which I believe in. I don't believe it has to be all big. You can have, we can have a whole bunch of sort of lesser artists who are just all sort of about that connection with the fans. Yeah. So I think absolutely. The, 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 two short, small observations about Bandcamp. One of which is that, that it is a streaming service. I mean, you know, the, the, unless, unless you block tracks and I've got friends who do block mm -hmm. it so you can only listen to a couple of tracks in their album, but I have all my stuff available there to, to be streamed 
for free by yeah. anyone at any point as many times as they want. I kind of like that because because the uniqueness of music is that the more we listen to it, the more we fall in love with it. That doesn't happen with film. People don't people don't yeah. watch a film twenty five times. It's not a, go, it's oh, not a paywall. It There's times. no paywall at Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't. And, I, and, I, and so so for me, it's much much more useful and and yeah. much more profitable. Apart from else, for me to Ow. have oh claws. Sorry, claws. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've suddenly got all Michael Jackson on us there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's much more profitable for me to have people listen on Bandcamp and have next to it a pay button where yeah. they can where they can buy things. So Ari's thing about Bandcamp needing to build a, a streaming platform is like, well, no, they've got one. I mean, the the mobile interface is lovely. If you want to bookmark a bunch of albums, if you're if you're, yeah. if you're broke, and uh, one of the things that I really like about Bandcamp is that I can have audiences that I can have audience members who are completely broke, and they don't have to scrabble around for pennies in order to pay for my stuff. They can listen to it. They can download it and pay what they want. And I, I so often get people who come back years later and go, you know what? I've d- downloaded everything of yours for free over the years, and now, and because uh, I sell my entire back catalogue on a USB stick. Yeah, when that gonna first buy came the whole out, thing, yeah. When that first came out, it's like twenty, uh, twenty something. I, I, I've lost count. Twenty something albums on a USB stick, and the number of people who bought it who said, "Well, I've downloaded all these for free, and I now feel like I should pay for them." Yeah. You know, my my career is not about what happens this year i don't it's not about me cashing in on a on a tune that is going to go huge and i don't, I don't want to retire off the back of one song but the idea that we should be worrying about about that is absurd i want to keep making music and i want to keep making it for people who like it and Absolutely. so th- so that having that longer term that longer framework in the relationship so that someone who who started listening to me 10 years ago can finally get around to the point of going you know what i'll buy the whole lot yeah, uh, Glenn, I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Glenn, I want to bring you in to uh, talk about David Byrne. So you had a Q&A that uh, came on to Billboard uh, uh, last week, I think, uh, uh, with yeah. him, where he raises some interesting points. I mean, he's always been very outspoken about uh, artist issues and different uh, monetization models and controversially so, because, of course, some people agree with him, some people don't. So uh, sort of how did that conversation come about? Uh, I think it was an email Q&A, but uh, sort of what were your main takeaways from that conversation that you thought st- stood out from, from, from the conversation? questions well the conversation came about because um, there's a lot going on in Washington DC this year about music licensing and copyright Uh, there's a big move to to update copyright law which comes about only once every 20 years at best Um, well 30 or 35 now it's it's been all 30 we're going on 40 I think and um, and there have been some hearings in the House Judiciary about music licensing uh, about um, well, a lot of copyright-related things, and 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 a lot of testimony from stakeholders all across the board, um, people representing musicians. We've had musicians and singer-songwriters and radio, and um, anybody from streaming. Well, there was yes, Pandora was represented, uh, labels, publishers, anyway. So, so the Copyright Office is is also doing a music re- a review of music licensing and solicited comments. And um, I've gone through a lot of those comments just to see where people, where different organizations stand on different issues. And, and that was really one of the, the reasons I reached out to David, because, um, because now I get to see where, how everybody would, if they had their way, would like to change copyright law to benefit them. And, um, and so I wanted, you know, his point of view on it. Uh, he's outspoken. He's, he's usually pretty eloquent about copyright and music licensing. And... Um, you know, I thought it was a good, uh, good short Q and A, which I think is available at uh, Billboard, and he put it on his blog as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, one of the things that uh, sort of piqued my interest in what he, he said, you know, philosophically, I think the issue is: do we always do what is best for the consumer in the short run, or do we think more uh, long term about our culture and quality of life? Is a giant corporation that under yeah. un- underprices everyone, everyone else, uh, and therefore seduces the consumer by the boatload, necessarily the best for our future, and not just uh, for the future of creative, but of all of us? Uh, and and so that's sort of an interesting question as we look at uh, companies like Pandora that, of course, uh, you know, we're looking at one of the news of this week is that, you know, the Q2 of Pandora, they still losing money. They lost over $11 million, even though analysts were hoping they would finally turn around and, and be- start becoming a profitable company. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think David's voice is important to have out there. And, and Congress has heard, um, you know, the, the artist voice. But. You know, he, he brings points out there that, that people need to consider because usually you get a lot of the business side and how companies need to make a profit and how companies need investment. And um, it's just a good point of view to have, and he asks good questions. Um, yeah. uh, is this ultimately good for art and the artist? And um, I don't think enough people 
can can ask that question. It's so important. Yeah, yeah. And Zoe, actually, you had a really interesting post uh, back in December about Spotify, actually, and streaming and how. Uh, those services affect uh, the the income of of the you know middle class musician or, or you know the musician that is independent and relies on, on, on making money from the recording music. So uh, have your thoughts evolved over the last few months at all? Uh, you know, of of course you're not negative about Spotify, but you you do have some concerns around how much you can monetize that. Um, I mean, I, I tried to sort of raise these questions as a token independent artist, and yeah. I I feel like personally I haven't actually seen any. Um, decline from streaming but uh i'm sort of a unique artist in that i existed perhaps before that but i don't know um I, it's but my point about it is just allowing artists to have control over the connection with their audience yeah um and also in i um i really liked the way that the um maybe this is sort of a key to my success is that my career has followed the trajectory of the internet yeah. and so um, it was a wonderful kind of wild west for a long time, and now mm. we have a, a consolidation um, among the these companies, like just like we did in it's like almost like the Ma Bell days. <laughs> yeah. It seems like we're just going to sort of consolidate until we have maybe Google who has Spotify and Apple who has Beats, and um, you know, you, it's sort of the, the consolidation worries me because we go back to a power model, and I think the controversy over the YouTube music service kind of reveals this, where what I liked about the internet in the early days of the last, you know, in the last beginning part of the decade was that um, uh, there were the little person, the little man could have the same deal as a large company for the most part. And we always, people who did file sharing and what have you, they railed against the music industry as being executives who kept the money from the actual artists. And so I feel like we're sort of moving into a, an ironic era where now the tech company is like the executive of the music industry. Where And going back to that contract where I don't have any ability to negotiate the terms of that. Yeah. And however, if I was a large media company, I would be able to negotiate those terms. And so I think that I just am always interested in how can the individual find success in this market and um, I've sort of found my own way around the music industry where I was rejected initially and mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks to the internet and so now perhaps the way that I did it isn't possible for other artists so that's kind of what I'm trying to talk about it's not like is this royalty this big or that big it's more like what power does the individual have and in it's going into the future mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sort of more focused on that than the actual amount <laughs> yeah. does that make any sense no absolutely it does actually yeah. and that kind of raises a point for me on on the value of association so uh, uh Glenn, sorry, did, did you have any uh, uh did you know anything about this content creators coalition that david byrne mentioned uh, uh i i haven't managed to look into it very much but uh, did, did you know what it's all about well i know a little bit about it i know there are a lot of artists um behind a lot of different types of creators and i i believe there are some authors involved and and i wouldn't be surprised if there are visual artists as well right um and they really want to do what was always talking about is is giving a collective voice and that collective ultimately i think collective negotiating power and uh to independent artists to artists of all kinds because um you know the the smaller the smaller the the the, the seller uh, yeah. the more difficult it is to go up against a really big buyer and um yeah. and it's it's one of the, the few examples of, of artists getting together and, and banding around in this type of issue. Yeah. Uh, I think we've seen yeah. a little bit of it, of it in the UK, um, but in the US, um, until until now, I don't think there's been something really cohesive like this. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to say about yeah, sure. the, uh, the Content Creators Coalition. Um, I was at the early meetings for that, and then I um, dropped out for various personal reasons that I've had. And um, But uh, it, it is very hard to organize artists around a topic and to find out what <laughs> their goal is and there are many artists who are against technology in general and then you have people on the other end of the spectrum like me where um, we need these services to survive but I don't feel like it should be money going to tech or money going to artists like why yeah. can't we like share it a little bit more um, so um, I, I know that there's a lot of really good people in that group and they're they're trying to find I think a common message for for all of them which i yeah. think is an um an admirable goal and i'm 
I'm very curious to see how it turns out. Yeah. But I, I, I've been, I, I'm always wary about like pitting the sides against each other. And I realize yeah. even I can do that in, by talking. And so I've been trying mm. to back off a little bit and just say like, well, what are the core issues we're talking about here? Um, and um, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, no, it's, it's super interesting. And uh, Steve, like, w what is your take on collective organizations of this kind? You know, of course, uh, we've been talking a lot about WIN, uh, the Worldwide Independent Network, but that seems to be really label focused for independent uh, labels. But as far as independent artists, as always saying, there's a featured artist coalition here in the UK. There's this new body uh, that we just talked about. Uh, but, you know, do you feel the need to be part of uh, something like that? <laughs> well, no, not normally. I mean, I, I kind of I like the idea with them. I think that they, they that the problem is that the, that the model they tend to follow is the lobby group idea, that mm -hmm. they have a, you know a manifesto and they will push that and they will go for that agenda. Yeah. And the problem with that is is that that they become uh, slightly myopic and that their role becomes to defend a position rather than to explore things in a, in a much mm -hmm. more useful way. And so the the people I tend to gravitate towards in these kind of discussions are academics. Because mm -hmm. if if they're not as long as they're not sponsored by some somebody or other, that that actually academics tend to be the ones who look at this from a, a much broader perspective, and do the research. And so there's I mean my favourite of them in terms of looking at, at what's good for artists and audiences is, is uh, uh, an amazing woman called Nancy Bain, yeah, who Nancy's Zoe's met as well. And that, I mean and, and she, the the stuff that she's doing on artist audience relationships and. And how and how we feel about it, not just what's what's good for money and what's good for this and that, but how, how it makes artists feel to expose themselves in a new way to their audiences by having to talk to them. And how some of us, I thrive on it, but there are other artists who find it difficult. And I think those kind of those bringing those kind of voices and that sort of research mentality into it is much more useful because because there are whole bits of this conversation that get missed. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, that, that, that none of the, the artist lobby groups are comfortable with the idea that it's possible that music has just become less important to people that, that because we as musicians it's 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 our lives but actually i mean i don't know if it's still the case but for a very long time after people were saying isn't it terrible that, that file sharing is cannibalizing uh, music sales actually sales of physical entertainment media were going up it's just that music was less important to people that games and dvd box sets look like much much better proposition uh, uh, as a sort of value commodity so people would go out and buy a house box set and get a thousand hours of, of Hugh Laurie's terrible American accent, mm -hmm. and that. Uh, but but what nobody was talking about was that that was a seventy song compilation album as well, and it was all licensed and paid for, and it was mm -hmm. for the most part brand new music. They weren't they weren't licensing Don't Stop Believing again. Yeah, they were they were paying for new artists <laughs> to kind of stick it on there. So the big the, the the majors weren't that interested in that because yes. for them most of their money is in is in the, the back catalogue is in the value yeah. of stuff that people audience because getting people to hear new music is really expensive. It always has been and it always will be. Yeah. Whether it's me doing it on my own or whether it's Warner's. Warner's going to make way, way more money out of the 100,000 songs that they own the rights to and they're already paid off that they can mm -hmm. license to other people for nothing just because people already want to hear them because they know them. Yeah. And if they I run out say, trying to launch new artists. Going back to the, I would say, yeah, music... Music is still important, but we're also all really, really busy. Yeah. <laughs> and nearly all the conversations I have about music with my friends who are not professional musicians are all about like, oh, which service should I choose? Because there's no way that I have time to like nobody rips CDs anymore. Like it's take too much time. Like <laughs> yeah, I would don't. Um, like in the past, it's like you'd get your CDs and you'd know every time you get one, you'd like put it in your computer, you download and you'd have like some central music collection. Even that is like way too hard now. Yeah. We have, you know, the, the, the shared drive in our house and I find that I don't use it anymore either. The shared drive full of music. I end up just going online to find it. So um, there's been... That's not necessarily about music. It's like this. There's just this erosion in time and, you know, and stuff. And so something like Spotify or you know, just use them as an example because we keep talking about them is incredibly convenient. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean that people don't like the music and they don't value it. It's just that they value their time more. <laughs> so I don't think I think to sort of rail against um, the streaming service is misguided and i've tried to focus on like it's not the service yeah. it is um again i kind of i guess i just take it personally if i can't negotiate with them directly like yeah. i can have an account with itunes and i get the same royalty rate i get the same rate on itunes as everybody else does yeah. and i can talk to them directly but i can't with spotify and i can't with like the youtube so, so, whatever so, so, know, so. <laughs> so, so the one the one other thing that i think that the the is missing in all this and particularly as it relates to Spotify and Google 
is that, that people aren't taking a step back and going, is ad funding actually an incredibly toxic way of, of building mm. a society yeah. and funding it? Because I don't want anything yeah. to do with it. I, I This is another one of my reasons for not putting things on Spotify yeah. or on Google Play, is I don't want to right. live in a world where people have to be have stuff they don't need pushed on them in order to mm -hmm. listen to my music. That's not that's not a triangle I want to be in, where there's me, my listeners, and then crap they don't need over here. And as long as they keep buying that crap, then then everything's okay. And I'm like, well, no, I, I don't want to be a part of that. That's actually I, a really good. That's actually a really good segue. Yeah. The next the next story was going to be about YouTube, and so uh, you know. Uh -huh. uh, it's been an interesting week. Uh, it's been an interesting few months actually for YouTube because uh, uh, you know the music service has hit uh, quite a few snags. Uh, you know the latest thing was that YouTube's product manager for music, Chris La Rosa, who played a key a key uh, part in, in building the music side of the service, left to join a small startup. Of course, uh, uh, you know one could uh, wonder whether uh, the issues that YouTube Music has had to launch and the issues uh, contractually have played a part in that exit or not. Uh, but you know it just essentially it. it marks the the end of a fairly hard few weeks uh, in the sense that you know they've had uh, issues around mm. you know first they announced the delay it was in march i think uh, or in april because of product issues and then uh, the worldwide independent network uh, went public detailing the disappointment in in the deals that were being offered uh, uh, by youtube and saying that of course labels had already signed on because it had uh, 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 very different deals offered to them and uh, after that there was a whole controversy about blocking uh, uh, independent artists uh, independent uh, videos from youtube if the labels doesn't sign the agreement and so uh, glenn how do you see this sort of playing out for youtube uh, is it just a, a little glitch in this huge massive mach machine or we're seeing a slightly bigger crack forming there as far as the music service is concerned? Uh, you mean crack in terms of, of uh, just challenges and, yeah, and yeah. staff leaving? I mean, as far as staff leaving, people leave for, for good opportunities mm -hmm. all yeah. the time. So I, I wouldn't think that, that much of that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, look, it's a big fight, and there's a lot to fight over. So it doesn't surprise me that, that YouTube is having a lot of issues these days. It's often said that YouTube is the new radio, and I think that that gets to the heart of it. There's the, YouTube has a lot of viewership. And uh, so people are fighting over a uh, precedent that will determine not just, uh, not just the, the, the rights and the, the, the legal terms that, uh, that determine you know, how artists interact with the service and how labels interact with the service, but uh, the financial consequences yeah. uh, over the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years mm -hmm. could be huge. So... There's a lot to fight over, and mm. it, it wouldn't surprise me if this is, is quite protracted because of that. I think my cat would like to say that he really likes the cat videos, and he likes the ability to get out there, you know, the, the YouTube as a platform. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I get the sense with YouTube that the um, the music thing, I mean, is was accidental for them. Like, they, they made yeah. this, you know, incredible platform, and then it became the number one way that, that people under the age of 20 um, consume music. And so I think they're like, oh, this is my guess. Oh, my gosh, we should turn this into something. And, and Google is a really big place, and... Um, you know, uh, they might not know a lot of artists. I don't know, because I get the sense, like, uh, you know, in my um, little interaction with my with my um, account manager there, that um, often it's the case that the things that I'm concerned about are things that sh they claim they hadn't thought of. So I don't know. Um, I have no idea what their design process is like, but I'm sort of guessing that this is just like that they didn't think it through or something I, uh, that sounds ridiculous for such a huge company it, it does but at the same time but, but you know, I, I get that sense from other products they have sometimes no it makes sense no <laughs> i think you're completely right i mean uh, on the one side you, we're thinking of google as this uh, hugely you know superior all all encompassing and uh, evil sort of monster that has, has become at least this evil monster because they know everything and they they can ask for any terms they like but at the same time it, th what's happened in the last few weeks kind of seems to shine a light on, on a lot of miscommunication internally for them as well uh, you know the fact that they announced this blocking without mm -hmm. giving details out and then everybody erupted in that and then the backtrack yeah. saying, oh we're not going to block and we're, we're not really sure what we're doing here and yeah I, I found them to be very reasonable i mean in my requests and so um, you know, with with the contract stuff, like you know, I've been talking with them for months since last year about it, and and I, I said what my concerns were, and they said, oh, okay, oh, we'll get back to you on that one, and you know, it wasn't like adversarial or anything. So, I just think that it's kind of uh, been an organic process, and I'm not. I that not that said, I don't know if. Um, 
I, I don't really understand where where it's going to go. I've been trying to imagine what the service would look like, and I, I yeah. and I, I'm, I'd be a part of it, and I still don't really know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens with that one. It's just, just yeah. so many uh, variables. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, you, you I, I take it from your stance that you're not on YouTube, or if you are, you're not monetizing the content, right? No, no. Well, this, this is the thing. So for me, YouTube, I, I've never ever thought about how to make money off YouTube. Right. I, I would. Yeah. I, if I'd like to be able to pay to get rid of the adverts, that both as a as a viewer and as an artist, I'd love. I'd love to be able to pay a hundred pounds a year and have no one have to look at adverts on my stuff. That would be great. I don't want to make money off it. I want to. I want to get rid of that. For me, YouTube is just about the audience. If it wasn't just if if there wasn't the audience there, I'd just stick it all on Vimeo instead. Yeah. But, but there's an awful lot of people that. Are, but but I tend to. I, I don't. I don't make like promotional videos. I yeah. I stick up. I put up videos of me mucking about with effects pedals and bits yeah. of live stuff and whatnot. It's so, Steve, Steve and I are kind of weird. Like we don't do videos, so um, yeah. we're probably. You know, <laughs> we should we should because we're both we're both really hot so we should be doing videos yeah kind of weird, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but there are but, there are like you know the, my fans slash listeners they do use youtube so like the yeah. thousands and thousands of videos that are up there are all third-party videos and so i don't stand in the way of that and i I do like the way that I have a. I can manage that if I want to by participating in the system, but I don't um, impede it unless it's some um, a company who's using the music without permission. But yeah. individuals and their art projects and what have you—that's fine. Yeah, for, the, cause, <laughs> cause for you, for you, like uh, user-generated UGC videos are actually a big thing. You have a lot of people that are using music for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. that, I, it's like I have a content manager account. So last check, it was in June. It was like eight thousand five hundred user-generated videos. You know. Wow. So um, right. that's what YouTube is for me, is a way for those listeners to express themselves and make another, you know, use the music in their own projects. And um, yeah, that's a, t a totally different thing than a music service in a way. Yeah, I'd, I'd have a content manager's account if I had that as well. Um, the thing, the thing that, I, that I've always really liked about, about YouTube is, is uh, it's a kind of, it's sort of, I don't know if it was just a side effect of the way that they set this up, is that I can put a cover version up there and the person who did the original will find out about it because of the way that creepy metadata works on YouTube. And they can then choose to monetize it or or, or, or have it taken down if they want. Yeah. And all of them, all of them are chosen to monetize. So I kind of love the fact that Pat Benatar sees me and my wife doing freaky covers of her songs and goes, yeah, I'll have some of that. That if she's going to make if she's going to make a hundred bucks off that. I'd rather she got it than I got it because she wrote the song. It's we not. It's not a hundred bucks. That's not. It's not the even <laughs> no, 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 no. It's so, no, what, I, no, what, I actually turned you? off the monetization just because, like, it was so not worth it I, to I well, interfere yeah. with people's experience. Like, I, I was like, you know, yeah. it, it's just that the money is so little and not. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, I, I have a couple of friends. I have a couple of friends who make a living out of it. And I think this this this, oh, wow. this cuts this cuts to the heart of, of of the problem with with ad monetization is that you have to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of iterations of whatever it is that you're doing yeah. for it to get anywhere close to kind of a, a, you know a, a part-time job flipping burgers kind of money yeah that that so you ha so it pushes creatives towards making generic middle of the road stuff that will generate that sort of views and i, I clearly i don't do that i you know i mm. have this ridiculous job that's sort of akin to being an erotic balloon modeler it's like what do you do i play bass on my own that's never going to generate that it's never going to do yeah, that yeah i, don't I mean tell me about it i do podcasts on the music industry so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go so, and so, so we, we, we do get a lot of views for this <laughs> we do it because we think it's important not because not because we think we're going to make out like bandits from ad revenue on it and so yeah. i think finding spaces because the, the, the thing about the conversation about about like headline figures of whether sales have dropped or Spotify use has gone up. I'm like, yeah, but how much of that is Nicki Minaj and yeah. Katy Perry? Because they don't live in the same world as me. There's that Polish phrase, "Ni moja malpi, ni moja." Oh, not my circus, not my monkeys. And I go, this isn't. That's not my circus. I don't live in that world. I don't care yeah. how many people are, are listening to Nicki Minaj on Spotify rather than buying her stuff on iTunes. Yeah. That's th it, that's not cannibalizing my listenership. And so, uh, sorry, I, I'm I'm conscious that uh, Glenn has to run in about a minute. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a last question, Glenn, then we'll let you go and then we'll close the show after you uh, uh, you leave it, that's all right. I just wanted to ask you, Vivo, do you think somebody's going to buy it? And if so, uh, how and uh, why? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't really have any comment on that. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen some names thrown around of, of, of companies that might buy Vivo. Yeah, uh, I think Apple was one. Uh, I think it, it would be really strange for the company that sells royal, uh, sells licenses to be acquired by the company that buys licenses. I'm not quite sure how that would work. So um, <laughs> uh, there might be some exits available for Vivo <laughs> investors at some point, but uh, but I'm not quite sure what it is. And I do want to go back to something Steve said. I think yeah, what sure. 
what Steve says, um, you know, shows that there's a, YouTube can be used for a lot of different things. If you want to monetize, you can. If you don't, if you don't even want to put official, quote unquote, official videos on there and let your fans do all the work, you can do that. Uh, it just it just means there's a lot of great content that that I think ultimately helps uh, helps artists. Um, I go to YouTube usually first when I want to learn something about an artist because yeah. it's the best place to look. And it doesn't have to be an official video. It can be anything that lets me uh, get a sense of what that artist is about. Awesome. Well, Glenn, thanks so much. Uh, again, it's at uh, Billboard Glenn. And if you go on Billboard.com and uh, search for uh, Glenn Peoples, you will find all his pieces on there. And thanks so much for your time. And we'll close the show with the, uh, with the guys here. Thank you. See you, Glenn. Well, I guess uh, uh, we are probably going to draw the show to a close uh, as well. But I want to, of course, uh, uh, give a bit of a plug to everything that you are doing or that's available online uh, from you. So, uh, uh, Zoe, I guess, uh, do you want to take it, take it away and uh, let people know where they can find uh, uh, sure. your music and, and uh, what's, the, what's the best way to essentially get hold of it? Um, you know, I've decided to release everything sort of in small chunks rather than an album since I can only work at little bits at the time right now. Yeah. Um, so this summer I'll have out an EP and, um, you can find that at zoekeating.com. That'll be where it'll be. So <laughs> fantastic. Hey, do you have a newsletter as well? Yeah. Like people can sign up to or something along those lines? Yeah. Yeah. I do have a newsletter. Um, I don't write very often, but it's all up yeah. there and, um, but you know, Twitter and Facebook are always a good way to find me. So. Awesome. That's perfect. <laughs> and uh, it's at, at Zoe Ch uh, Cello. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. Zoe Cello. Just look for Zoe Cello and I think I'll come up. Yeah, that's great. And also, on the video, of course, the video version has got your Twitter handle on it as well. But uh, if mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of audio listeners out there, so I just wanted to make sure that they yeah, knew about it as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. And, Thanks for uh, And uh, Steve, uh, from, from your end, well, what's the best way to get to know more about you and, and get hold of your music? Um, I'm solo based Steve on most of the internet. So that's three S's in the middle, which is kind of awkward, but solo based Steve on Twitter. Um, and stevelawson.net on the web. stevelawson.com will get you a cheap house in Detroit. stevelawson.net <laughs> will find you. I didn't realize uh, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'll have a deal for you or something like that. And um, they're very cheap in Detroit, so yeah. It's a there's good deal. a lot of Steve Lawson's online. I keep bumping into them. There's one, there's one guy in Denver I really want to meet who's a librarian, and he's much, much cooler than me. He's my favorite online, Steve Lawson. We're, we're Facebook friends. Day. You, you yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to go and hang out because he's just great. He's he's yeah. really really nice. Look, <laughs> there's also a Texan preacher. I have far less interest in. Um, but Steve Lawson .net is me, and there's uh, endless and more music than you could ever possibly find useful is there. Um, and yeah, the the Bandcamp link is all is on the front there, and mailing yeah. list and all that stuff. Perfect. So, thank you. That's fantastic. Well, uh, uh, you know, Zoe, thank you so much. I wish you all the best for the next month and excited thank about you. the EP coming out. And uh, uh, Steve, great to have you on for the first time. And I, I really hope I'll have you both back on again at some point. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much for listening Bye. to the Digital Music Trends show. Bye, you can Steve. find everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. Have a fantastic week. And uh, till next time.